The following video demonstrates how to prune an open center fruit tree. This is a plum tree in a Southern California urban orchard. For reference, you'll see a picture of how the tree looks before pruning and the configuration of the tree after pruning. Good morning. Good morning. Today we're going to show you how to pr prune a plum tree. Plum trees want to be pruned with an open center to maximize the amount of sunlight hitting the branches. We're going to choose four or five main scaffold branches to save that will give us a nice vase-like structure. And we'll point, we'll step back and take a look at the tree for a moment. So as you can see, this tree looks very crowded in the middle. So we'll have to remove some of the branches in the middle. And also at the top, there's a lot of crowdedness right here. Pretty much half of them will be pruned off. So now we'll point out the branches that we've decided to save that will be the main scaffold branches of the tree. This will be one. This will be another. That one in the back will save as well. Then we'll keep this one in the middle that has a lot of uh, small branches that will bear fruit. And then one more here on the side. This way, these the scaffold branches will be e evenly spaced uh, to allow maximum sunlight. Before we start pruning, we're going, to, we're going to remove the suckers, which are little trees and, and uh, shoots that come from the rootstock. Uh, which is different than the tree. We're cleaning our pruners with uh, alcohol uh, to disinfect them from any possible virus or bacteria before we begin pruning the tree. We're going to start by removing extra branches arising from the trunk at its apex, branches that are not part of our permanent scaffold system. This cut is made at the bark branch collar which is a characteristic swelling at the base of every branch and every shoot. All right. Notice that this branch is also denuded of its bark and a very good entry for disease. So it's good that we remove that one. We're now gonna do another thinning cut with the loppers, cutting at the bark branch collar. The objective of the thinning cut is to cut the branch so it does not recur. That branch is a little too large to cut with the lopper, so we're using the pruning saw once again. And notice how the cut is done right at the little swelling at the base of the branch. This is the area that can heal most rapidly. This is an example of a crossing branch that needs to be removed to avoid friction between uh, the two branches. So I'm gonna saw it off right here at the collar. The teeth of this saw has what's called set and they stick out a little bit on each side so that the kerf is wider than the body of the saw and doesn't bind as the saw goes through the branch. You're on. This is an example of a damaged branch where the bark has been peeled off. Uh, this branch also is shaded by the rest of the tree, so it may have to come off. We're now going to take off any additional branches that are coming off from the apex of the trunk and conflicting with our scaffold branches which are the main structural component of the open center tree. This area at the origin of the scaffold branches is densely shaded by the canopy of the tree and is not the place for any branches that are going to bear fruit. By removing all these poorly placed branches, we're ensuring that our scaffold branches will bear all of the laterals. And the laterals coming off the scaffold branches are more horizontal in in their position and they will carry all of the fruiting shoots that are renewed each year. 
It's a good idea to make an undercut on branches this size so that when you cut entirely through, the branch does not tear off a little tongue of bark. Now the remaining stub can be cut off safely so that we have to nice secrete a waxy substance over the next day or two called serotin, which will cover the area and protect it during the healing process. And that's a nice clean cut with no injury to the bark of our major scaffold branch. Danielle is now going to do a two-step cut to remove a branch that's not part of our permanent scaffold. It's done first by cutting across, not right at the bark branch collar, but at a point where she can remove this major branch and have a little more room to make a normal cut. Along the swelling that was at the base of that branch, the area called the bark branch collar, because even though this is a large attachment, the cambium will heal in from the sides from that little swollen collar, which is a very active area of the cambium. This is another one of those large branches that's going up the middle of the tree, and it's not part of our scaffold. And Danielle is going to make another thinning cut right at this area. And again, she has us all lined up at the bark branch collar, just outside or distal to the bark branch collar. Okay. And now completing that cut, she's the completed cut once again shows the cambium intact all around the bark branch collar. You can see the heartwood and the rings that represent the growth of this tree. So that is a perfect thinning cut. The tree is now 50% pruned and Daniela is piling up the branches uh, that we've taken off so far. So you can get an idea of how the pruning process is evolving in this open center plum tree. We have completed phase one of pruning. We are now down to six scaffolding branches that are all equidistant. And here we have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now we can move to phase two of our uh, pruning project by thinning out the canopy of this tree. Now that we have our scaffold limbs uh, selected and all pruned, we're moving up the canopy. And to maintain the vase shape, we want each successive level to, to start with a Y, because there'll be a number of branches coming out wherever we've made pruning cuts, but we want to reduce that to two. And the Ys get further and further apart and, and maintain that vase shape. Sometimes we have to make the cuts in several steps to make it easier to get the pruners in place. You have to move around the tree, keeping in mind what you're doing, and keep a good mind's eye view of the structure, because you've got to move into good positions as you're going. Okay, I think that has a nice fan shape and we've got good space for all our branches and the laterals, which are these small ones coming off more or less horizontal, will have the fruiting and the flower buds. Got one more stump to take off here. We have to decide now which branches to keep, which branches to remove 
from the scaffolding branch. So we decided to keep this back branch that bifurcates into a Y shape um, and we'll remove those that are shading these two back branches. The first one to go is this big stump where nothing is growing on it. We are gonna remove anything that crosses over. So this small branch right here, this one that, that shades the back branch as well. On this side, we have two branches that are competing with each other. One of them will have to go. So we're gonna remove this one. And finally, we have a branch that's crossing over onto the next uh, scaffolding branch. So we'll have to uh, cut it halfway uh, with a heading cut to prevent rubbing of one branch against the other. By preserving these Y-shaped configurations, we're ensuring plenty of space between our branches. Yes, it is. Here we have two branches that are too close together and shading one another, particularly when they begin to leaf out. But we'd like to save both of them because they have a lot of nice young branches with fruiting buds. And this is a time to use a spreader. So we put this stick in here and we move that here. And now you see we've moved these wide apart and both of them are a nice space to get plenty of sunshine. So we've saved a good branch by changing the position. After about two or three months, the spreader can come out or at the end of the season because these will begin to grow in that position. Now that we continue trimming the laterals, we do have these little lateral shoots coming off our main scaffold branches that are growing towards the center, which is not a good idea. Uh, this one is uh, very dry and may, may not be very functional, so we'll take that one out. This one has some nice new growth, and even though it's growing towards the center, we can shorten it and probably get some fruit on there. This one is another one. You can see it's a light tan color. It's last year's growth. It's growing nice fruit buds. We'll just shorten it. We'll shorten that one. We'll cut off that one. This one is crossing our main branch. We don't want to lose it because there's some nice little fruit buds there. So we'll do our heading cut in the direction of the bud right there. Now we're continuing to prune the laterals. We continue to trim the branches coming off of our main scaffold branches so they can support many laterals that do not conflict with one another. A stopping cut down at the top is cut into three or four year old wood where there's a side branch. We're now in the final phase of our pruning where we're, we're trying to control the tree's size so it doesn't grow too high above the wall. And so we're making cuts across the top at about a foot above the, the wall. We're going to do our final um, phase of pruning, the fine tuning. We're going to shorten the fruiting uh, branches by about a third to promote growth of uh, more side branches for next year's uh, uh, fruit production. So each of these, especially the, long, uh, the longer ones, we're going to cut off by about a third And remember that when you cut, uh, the new branch will grow in the direction that the bud is pointing towards. Okay, I think that has a nice fan shape and we've got good space for all our branches. 
and the laterals, which are these small ones coming off more or less horizontal, will have the fruiting and the flower buds. Got one more stump to take off here. Okay. As Daniela demonstrated, the final step is paying attention to last summer's growth. These uh, brownish, greenish, smooth barked shoots are the fruiting shoots for this year's crop. They are loaded with flower and with shoot buds. Every other one of these, the smaller one, will be shortened to three buds with the bud at the tip pointing upward and outward, which will be a strong shoot for next summer's growth. The thicker and longer shoots are trimmed by a third and they will bear the fruit for this coming year. Remember, with the stone fruit, the shoot grows one summer and the flowers and fruit form the second summer. And for things like peaches and nectarines, they'll never flower again on the same shoot. And that's why you have to continue to renew the wood and make sure you get new fruiting shoots every season. And be careful not to prune too many of these out because that's where the fruit will be. This is the final configuration after pruning, showing an excellent relationship between scaffold branches, laterals, and fruiting shoots.